Today we're going to talk about battery safety and how the DNB rules affect this and how they can affect this. Battery safety is an interesting topic as there are many elements of safety. Choose a good chemistry, build a safe battery, incorporate a good computer management system to oversee it, add good firefighting and barriers to failure in the actual installation, and ensure that the battery is integrated properly with the PMS on board the application. If all of the above are not consolidated into a single summary, then safety is with an asterisk. If they are, we have a starting point. Today, there are two tests acceptable to DNV. Total prevention of propagation from cell to cell within a module, or the old standard of no propagation between modules if the module is less than 11 kilowatt hours. Standard one is the most difficult to achieve and needs to become the de facto standard for all batteries. There are lots of examples in the evolution of lithium ESS that demonstrate why standards need to be very stringent today, and even more so for improving it for tomorrow. As a longtime shipbuilder, we have always accepted that everything can break, burn, explode, and fail, but that fact does not mean that we should accept lesser engineering from our suppliers or fail to evolve. Let's visually examine the risk. This video will show a single cell being forced to fail. To put this in scope, this is a 75 amp hour cell being forced to fail. In a single megawatt hour battery, there would be about 3,900 of these cells in place. And regardless of the chemistry, this represents a tremendous amount of energy to safely manage. Here, we have two examples of cell fires. There are many that have occurred. I can comfortably say I've had my own share of failures on board boats, and all of them are instrumental in our learning curve of improvement and awareness of the risks we face. In both cases here, people were injured. There was a lot of residual destruction and lives could have been lost. Fortunately, this was not the case. But we all need to take seriously the impact of the rules we work under and the safety we are trying to achieve. Here's an example of how a battery should fail. Total destruction of the cell, but no propagation to the cells adjacent. This is a nail penetration test of a fully charged 75 amp hour cell that demonstrates what we call a positive failure. Now, let's revisit the required standard. You have seen the amount of energy in a single 75 amp hour cell that represents about 0.277 kilowatt hours of energy. You have seen the change in failure from the single cell uncontrolled to a single cell in a well engineered controlled environment. It's reassuring. Imagine that same cell being allowed to completely fail in an 11 kilowatt hour module. That is roughly 39 cells all being allowed to explode totally depending on adding engineering systems and third-party systems to prevent that failure from causing more damage and further failure. If you're comfortable with that risk, okay. But if not, insist your battery supplier has met test one, no propagation between cells in a module. What are the conditions of test one? The cells have to be fully charged and stable at 25 degrees C. Then they can either be heated or over voltaged until thermal runaway occurs. Temperature sensors need to be installed on the cell that is failed as well as the adjacent cells, and any safety protocols built into the battery need to be disabled. The temperature of the environment needs to be 5 degrees C over the re recommended temperature that the battery manufacturer suggests is ideal ambient. In our case, that means the coolant system needs to be running at around 2 GPM at 31 degrees Celsius. Once the cell's failed, the battery needs to be monitored for 24 hours to ensure no follow-on fires or explosions occur. Then the battery is disassembled and the adjacent cells are tested for signs of off-gassing, voltage, and general state of health. They need to be intact and fully functional. The failed cell is examined and the failure is validated. This test needs to be repeated three times for each battery tested. The acceptance criteria for this test is simple. The adjacent cells need to survive 
and the fail cell needs to be destroyed. If this works, then we can safely show our customers, our flag authorities, and any required standard bearers that DNV 2020 represents a good measure of safety in our product and reduce risks for our customers. The best results here is that if a failure occurs, it does not take a vessel out of service or cause any long-term damage, but it is a measured and serviceable failure that can quickly be rectified and investigated, leading to better and better standards. Here, you see the results of our test. On the left, the two adjacent cells to the one that failed, both showing signs of carbon scoring and smoke residue at the top of the cells, but otherwise in very good shape. To the right, the module in question is going through its failure, and you can see it's all encompassing. For the record, the adjacent cells increased in temperature to about 30 degrees Celsius during the event, while the failed cell achieved at least 700 degrees Celsius. So now, as customers, you have to ask yourselves if the battery system you are using is safe and is the method of cooling effective. There are many versions of batteries today, from completely air-cooled to partially liquid-cooled and fully liquid-cooled. Cooling air is dependent upon large, energy-hungry HVAC systems. Partially cooled usually means a hybrid, with both liquid cooling and air cooling working in tandem, and fully liquid cooled means working in an environment where the air is not present. The difference in the mediums are defined by physics. Air cooling requires about 3,200 liters of air to match the same liquid cooling capacity of a liter of liquid cooling, a stark difference and a large dependency on third-party equipment to manage the cooling. Are fires inevitable or preventable? Both. The better we engineer and the better standards we place in front of all manufacturers, the more likely a fire can be prevented. As I mentioned earlier, everything can fail. But with a lot of thought and preventative engineering, I like to call this failure paranoia, we can reduce the odds. In Arizona, there was a land-based fire that was caused by an internal cell failure, every battery manufacturer's nightmare. The firefighter in question was lucky to survive. The topic often comes up of safe chemistries, but this is a simple fallacy. I have burned megawatt hour batteries in pursuit of the elegant solution and seen inadvertent failures occur that taught us anything can and will happen. The simple truth is that while some chemistries have different thresholds of failure, everything can fail in a spectacular way. It all depends on the fundamental quality of the design of the battery in its entirety and the environment we build our systems in. We're creating an ecosystem, and it all needs to be in balance. The truth is, the fire in Arizona was preventable. A cell failure is our worst nightmare, but it does happen. Everything happens. If the battery had a better management system that was capable of predictive failure modeling based on monitoring the voltage and temperature of each cell in the entire system, it probably would have had no explosion. A more robust safety system could have evacuated the gas produced and reduced the risk of collecting gas in a density that could cause an explosion. Better training on how to manage the fire could have prevented the firefighter from opening the door that ultimately injured him. We're always working to achieve what we call DNV 2050. What will the standards evolve into? We're currently testing a new level of safety, a test that does not yet exist. We're actively exposing our batteries to 900 degrees Celsius plus temperatures directly to see if our thermal management system can prevent the cells from contributing to a fire. And so far, we've had great success. When we have completed this and have third-party validation, we'll bring this development to the table of the type approval authorities to figure out a way to recognize this and make it a part of the engineering standards dialogue. Propagation is the enemy. We are challenging all customers to demand that the test one of DNV becomes the test that all battery suppliers must pass. I believe completely that allowing an 11 kilowatt hour module to fail will put the risk of catastrophic failure too high to accept, but it's ultimately the customers who can determine this by demanding this standard for their installations. Thanks very much for your attention today. Remember one of our maxims. You're allowed to make every mistake in the book once as long as you learn from it and you don't repeat it. Battery safety and battery safety and engineering is a great place for that maxim to be applied. We know we can achieve this by working together and sharing the results of our failures to build for better successes.